Hello and welcome to our live stream on enslaved women at Monticello. My name is Naya Bates. I am our senior fellow of African American history and I'm here with my colleague. I am Ashley Hollinsud and I am a guide and house tour supervisor here at Monticello. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the enslaved women at Monticello. This month, of course, is Women's History Month. And we're excited to share some stories with you about the enslaved women who lived and worked here at Monticello. We're gonna start this morning by talking about Monticello's, probably Monticello's most well-known enslaved woman. Uh, her name was Sally Hemings, and we'll start with a video that shares a little bit about her life, and then we'll get back to you with some questions. Sally Hemings is the most famous enslaved woman in Monticello's history. Born in 1773, Hemings was her mother's 10th of 12 children, the sixth child her mother bore by her owner, John Wales. Sally Hemings came to Monticello as a toddler shortly after John Wales died, and her family became Thomas Jefferson's property through his wife and Hemings' half-sister, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson. Hemings spent her youth as a nursemaid to Jefferson's younger daughter, Mariah. When Hemings was 14 years old, she was chosen by Jefferson's in-laws to accompany Mariah to Paris, France, as a domestic servant and maid. In Paris, Hemings could have petitioned for her freedom since the laws in France technically opposed slavery. She would have been exposed to urban life, culture, and the arts in ways that she never would have experienced in rural Virginia. According to Hemings and Jefferson's son, Madison Hemings, his mother became Jefferson's concubine and was pregnant with their first child by the end of their time in Paris. In 1789, prior to returning to Virginia, Hemings negotiated for extraordinary privileges for herself and freedom for her children. Although Sally Hemings has been a public figure since 1802, most details about her personality, appearance, and daily life escaped the archives. Her son Madison's memoir tells us that she had light duties as a maid and seamstress in comparison to other enslaved women at Monticello. Like countless enslaved women, she had no legal right to refuse unwanted sexual advances and ultimately bore six children fathered by Thomas Jefferson. We do not know if Hemings ever had any substantial relationships, romantic or otherwise, with other men. Unlike countless enslaved women, Sally Hemings was able to negotiate with her owner she raised four children, Beverly, Harriet, Madison, and Esten, and prepared them for their eventual emancipation. Her sacrifices meant that her children would leave slavery at Monticello and their mother behind. By the later years of her life, Beverly and Harriet had left Monticello and passed into white society. At Jefferson's death, Hemings received an unofficial freedom that allowed her to live in Charlottesville with her younger sons, Madison and Esten, until her death in 1835. The location of her grave is not known. Sally Hemings should be known today not just as Jefferson's concubine, but as an enslaved woman who, at the age of 16, negotiated with one of the most powerful men in the nation to improve her own condition and achieve freedom for her children. So, Naya, you touched on this in the video, but could you talk a little bit more about how we know what we know about Sally Hemings? Absolutely. Uh, learning about enslaved women is so difficult. Um, learning about women in general in the 18th and 19th centuries can be hard because their names, their lives, their stories uh, often get left out of the archive. Fortunately for enslaved people here at Monticello, we have a great deal of records that were written down by Thomas Jefferson, by visitors, by members of the family uh, who provide us a lot of details about the enslaved people. Uh, but they don't tell us everything. And in the case of Sally Hemings, we have details about her life from her son, Madison Hemings, who left a memoir in a Southern Ohio newspaper in 1873, where he discussed his mom and her life and what it was like for them here at Monticello. So we're so fortunate to have that source of information from Madison. And we also have a tremendous wealth of information from uh, descendants who have given us oral histories as well. And Sally Hemings was a part of a large enslaved family at Monticello. Could you tell us about some of the other women in the Hemings family? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mentioned that Sal in the video, I mentioned that Sally Hemings uh, is one of 12 children uh, born to Elizabeth Hemings, who we consider to be the matriarch of the Monticello enslaved community. 
Uh, we know through our research here that over 80 members of that family uh, were enslaved on this mountaintop. So Sally Hemings on a daily basis would have been surrounded by people who were her siblings, her aunts and uncles, her cousins, uh, nieces and, and nephews. These are all people that she would have known very intimately uh, and would have worked closely with on a daily basis. So um, some of the other women in the family we know about uh, Priscilla Hemings, who would have been uh, the head nursemaid here. She worked in the house. She took care of the children. Uh, we know about uh, her mother, Elizabeth Hemings, and her roles here at Monticello. And we also know a great deal about Sally Hemings' sisters, who uh, we'll hear a little bit more about in this video. And you mentioned both in the video as well as in one of your previous uh, comments about Madison Hemings and his memoir. Um, what do some other descendants of Sally Hemings say about her? Absolutely. The descendants are so generous in sharing their stories with us and allowing us to record their oral histories. Uh, part of the work that we do here with the Getting Word African American Oral History Project is to collect these stories so that descendants can pass them down uh, to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. Uh, and in doing those interviews, and we've been doing them since 1993, uh, we've learned from descendants about their thoughts on Sally Hemings. And some of the things that they're most excited about about Sally Hemings are the ways that she was able to negotiate for freedom for her children um, to descendants that represents a source of pride, a source of power. Uh, it's something that they really admire about Sally Hemings. Uh, we've also heard from descendants who uh, talk about her looks and how other women in the family may have looked like Sally Hemings. And since there are no portraits, it's actually really great to hear descendants sharing about, you know, what they think she may have looked like. Um, and they also tell us things about her tenacity um, and what it means to them to have this history uh, to pass down to each other. So we're, we're super excited to hear more and more um, from descendants about Sally Hemings. So the next video that we're going to show is a little bit about Sally Hemings' older sister, Mary Hemings Bell. Um, she is enslaved here at Monticello, but she goes on to live a very eventful life. So uh, please bear with us. We're going to switch to a video. Hello, my name is Ashley Hollinsud, and I am a guide here at Monticello. In the mid-1770s, the Hemings family first arrived here at Monticello. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had inherited the Hemings family as a result of the death of his father-in-law, a man named John Wales. As the Hemings family arrived here at Monticello, there was a young enslaved woman who came here named Mary Hemings. Mary Hemings was a young woman. She was in her mid-20s when she arrived here at Monticello, and she labored as an enslaved household servant as well as a seamstress. So you can imagine Mary Hemings laboring here at Monticello. She's working inside the household of a man who would very soon proclaim to the entire world that all men are created equal. Mary Hemings, she raised a family here at Monticello. She had four children who were born here. And two of her children ended up being separated from her, her two eldest. And when Thomas Jefferson moved to France to serve as the ambassador, he started leasing out enslaved people here, including Mary Hemings. Mary Hemings was leased by a white merchant in the city of Charlottesville named Thomas Bell. And so Mary Hemings and her two youngest children, uh, Joseph and Betsy, they ended up moving into the city of Charlottesville with their mother. And there they grew up in the city of Charlottesville. Their mother is laboring for Thomas Bell. And while Mary Hemings is there at this house, she and Bell form some type of relationship. It's a relationship that lasted um, until t uh, Bell's death in 1800, and Mary Hemings, she gave birth to two children by Thomas Bell. And when Thomas Jefferson returned to the United States following his ambassadorship, Mary Hemings actually approached Jefferson and asked him to sell her and her children to Thomas Bell. Jefferson agreed, and he told Mary Hemings that he would sell her to Thomas Bell with some of her children, but not all of her children. Her 12-year-old son Joseph and her nine-year-old daughter Betsy would return here to Monticello in bondage. And so we see Mary Hemings Bell for the, the second time in her life experiencing the separation of her family. Right? She's being separated from two of her other children. Of the six children that she gave birth to, four were ultimately separated from her. And even though her children were only enslaved here at Monticello just a few miles away, Mary Hemings Bell is experiencing that separation. She, by all accounts, did remain um, close to her children who were enslaved here at Monticello. 
Her son, Joseph, uh, Joseph Fawcett, he would have labored along in the shops here along Mulberry Road. He actually grew up to become the head enslaved blacksmith here at Monticello, and his shop would have been located here behind me. Joseph Fawcett, he experienced a separation from his mother, and he would then experience, experience his own mother's pain of family separation when in 1827 he was separated from some of his own children at the estate cell that was held here following Jefferson's death. But his mother, Mary Hemings Bell, she had formed this association, this relationship with Thomas Bell. And when Thomas Bell passed away, Mary Hemings Bell, she inherited his property. Her children were acknowledged as being Bell's children. By all accounts, Mary Hemings Bell and Thomas, Thomas Bell had some type of affectionate relationship. Neighbors in the city of Charlottesville actually commented and referred to them as a, a, having a common law marriage. Mary Hemings Bell was referred to as being Thomas Bell's common law wife. And so because of this association that she had and because of the property that she had inherited and her children being recognized and being able to marry, they were able to use some of that property and wealth to then purchase some of Joseph Fawcett's family members. So when we think about Mary Hemings Bell's story, her story is one that highlights the complexities of the institution of slavery. Her story doesn't minimize the prevalence in which enslaved women were sexually exploited by white men, but rather her story illustrates this complexity of the institution. Her story is one that highlights strength and courage, what enslaved women were willing to do for their family, to keep their family stable, to better the lives of their children. Mary Hemings Bell, she lived her life not as a statistic, but she's living her life as a person and a person with a story to tell. Right? Her story is just one that highlights and illustrates the individuality, the resiliency of the human spirit and what was needed to one day fully realize this promise of America, this promise that all people are created equal with rights to life, liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. Wow, Mary Hemings Bell's story is so remarkable in its own right. Uh, and so far we've heard about two enslaved women who were separated from their children at various points in time. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how common it is for uh, enslaved women to be separated from their children and families through sale or emancipation or any other thing. Absolutely. Uh, one of the harshest realities of slavery was the separation of families. And it was this constant threat and fear of family separation that really undergirded the entirety of the institution of slavery. And so even families that were together for a time, there was this constant fear that at less than a moment's notice, they could be separated from their parents, their children, their mothers, fathers forever. And here at Monticello, we know that of the over 600 people that Thomas Jefferson enslaved, roughly 400 um, of the enslaved people here experience some form of family separation, whether that be through sale or by gift. And so that's roughly two thirds of the people who were enslaved here at Monticello experiencing some type of family separation like Mary Hemings Bell did. That's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and it speaks to a lot of the unique family structures that enslaved people here at Monticello had. So my follow-up question for you is, could you, you mentioned in the video that Mary Hemings Bell and Thomas Bell were referred to as being in a common law marriage. Um, can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. Um, so Mary Hemings Bell and Thomas Bell were referred to by neighbors as having a common law marriage. And Mary Hemings Bell is often referred to as Thomas Bell's common law wife. Um, dating back to the 1600s here in Virginia, there was a law that outlawed interracial marriage. Um, and so legally, Thomas Bell and Mary Hemings Bell, if they had wanted to get married, they, they couldn't. So that marriage is not going to be legally recognized. Um, and in fact, uh, interracial marriage was illegal here in Virginia all the way up until the 1960s, until Mildred and Richard Loving challenged the state of Virginia in Loving versus Virginia in 1967, um, which is not that, not that long ago. No, it's not. That's really recent. Mm -hmm. That's really recent. So both of us get to be here doing this work and sharing these stories. And we're both women um, spending a great deal of time talking about mm -hmm. enslaved women here at Monticello. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing with people uh, what that's like for you as a woman to be here telling these stories. 
Absolutely. Um, it's very inspiring um, as a woman to, to be telling stories of women here, because when you look into the stories of people like Sally Hemings and Mary Hemings Bell and Minerva Granger, as we'll learn more about, you find stories of strength and courage, um, but also recognizing that I am working and interpreting um, at a site of enslavement, and I am a white woman who is interpreting the lives of enslaved women. And so that um, uh, helps me kind of recognize it and interpret that, you know, while I, I tell stories of the enslaved women here, I, as a white woman, will never fully understand their experiences. And so recognizing that I won't understand their experiences, I think, is, is important when we, when we tell their stories, or at least when I tell their stories um, here at Monticello. And there are so many different stories that we can tell of enslaved women here at Monticello. Um, we've learned about Sally Hemings, who was enslaved here on the mountaintop, Mary Hemings Bell, who was enslaved um, here at Monticello and then moved into the city of Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. And now we'll learn about Minerva Granger, who was enslaved here, uh, working off of this mountaintop in one of the quarter farms here. Minerva Granger was one of the women who helped to power Jefferson's agricultural endeavors here on his Monticello plantation. And because Minerva Granger was an enslaved laborer working in the fields, she was one of the women that was the backbone that made up Jefferson's working farm. So we're actually standing right now at Tufton. Monticello is just over the ridge line, but this is where Minerva Granger lived for the latter part of her life. She lived here when Jefferson died in 1826. Women often don't make it into the documentary record. Oftentimes they're left out, and she very rarely made it into the documentary record. Jefferson didn't interact with her on a daily basis, so she didn't show up in the records as often as some of her counterparts did who lived on the Monticello mountaintop. So we have to find other ways to learn about Minerva Granger and her life and her experience here at Monticello. We do know a few things about her though. We know, for instance, that she was born in 1771 at Shadwell, which is the property where Jefferson grew up. From Tufton, it's just located over the river, um, so it's pretty close by. When she was two years old, she was moved to Monticello, thus beginning her lifelong movement across the property. Her parents were Squire and Belinda, whose surnames we don't actually know. They were never recorded. Jefferson's mother, Jane, actually owned them, and they were conveyed to Jefferson when Minerva Granger was a young girl. In the 1780s, she married into the Granger family. She married Bagwell Granger. His parents were George Sr. and Ursula, and they were some of the most prominent members of the enslaved community here at Monticello during that time. They held some of the most prominent roles on the plantation. Minerva had nine kids. She had her first when she was just 16 years old, and she had her last child when she was 39 years old. Minerva Granger shows up in the documentary record as a farm laborer most frequently. We know that she was issued three hoes, one for hilling, weeding, and then one for grubbing crops before the plow came. During the wheat harvesting time, men and women worked together, but they did different types of activities during that time. Minerva's husband Bagwell would have headed out with the men and would have used uh, cradle siths to chop the wheat crop and Minerva and her children and her family members would have followed behind and harvested the wheat and bound it together. Documents gives us the name of people but archaeology can actually provide a more complete unbiased reading of the historical record in a way that um, the document simply can't provide us. So we can look to archaeological sites to kind of provide sort of an upper level analogy of the type of site that Minerva Granger may have been living at here at Tufton during the last years of Jefferson's life. Based on these archaeological sites, one of which we're digging now, which is called Site 6, it's an early 19th century quarter site dating uh, to the early 19th century in which enslaved field laborers would have been living and working in the nearby agricultural fields. This site would have been the home of three cabins, and we know that not from the documentary record, but from the artifact assemblages that we've recovered as a result of over 10 years of work there. This site has objects like storage vessels, so there's stoneware. There are things like beads and buttons and buckles. There are bridal bits, there's horse hardware, there's finely painted pearlware, there's tea bowls, teacups. 
we think that that one cabin is a place where a family might have been living. Um, that cabin actually we also found uh, one cent piece at. We know that these people had some sort of independent economy. So those people living in that cabin, perhaps people like the Granger family, would have taken that money to market in either Charlottesville or nearby Milton, which is just down the road from Tufton, and would have purchased those objects. At the end of her workday, Minerva Granger would have returned to her cabin, which would have been about a 12 by 14 foot wooden cabin, probably made of chestnut logs. She would have returned home from the fields to start her second job, which was that of a mother. She would have probably taken over from her mother, Belinda, who probably watched the, the children while Minerva was working in the fields. She would have also done things like made sure her children had enough to eat and make, made sure that their clothing was mended. She would have worked in the vegetable garden and helped to maintain the poultry yard as well. So each generation is in charge of telling their own story and learning about their, their family history and learning what, where we came from and where they're headed. And we've been lucky enough at Monticello to get to share the stories of the Granger family. They've been gracious enough to share their stories with us as part of the Getting Word project. The Granger family has been an important part of the fabric of Monticello for the last 200 years. Excellent. So Crystal from our archaeology team talks a little bit in the video about uh, how we find more information about women like Minerva Granger mm -hmm. who lived and worked in the field. Uh, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how we know what we know about enslaved women um, who are not working as closely to the house. Of course. And I think that's one of the, the challenges of not only interpreting the lives of enslaved people, but particularly interpreting the lives of enslaved women. Um, because oftentimes enslaved people, um, particularly enslaved women, are not appearing in the historical record, um, especially women like Minerva Granger, who labored far away from this mountaintop and didn't appear in Jefferson's records as much as some of the other um, enslaved people and enslaved women here. And so using some, uh, a lot of different primary sources, uh, using archaeology, as Crystal talked about, is incredibly important in understanding who uh, Minerva Granger was and who enslaved women were as people. Um, and while we may not have their thoughts and their emotions put down on paper, um, learning through archaeology, even using oral histories, as you talked about with Sally Hemings, um, can help us better understand um, not only their stories as to what their jobs were here at Monticello um, as field laborers or as enslaved house servants, but really trying to understand more of who they were as people and what their individual lives and stories were here at Monticello. Yeah, and speaking a little bit to that, Naya, could you talk more about what other jobs enslaved women, uh, enslaved women would have had here at Monticello? And in addition to that, talking a little bit more about what that independent economy that Crystal mentioned was. Absolutely. Enslaved women here are doing many of the same things that men are doing. Um, but in terms of knowing what kind of jobs are specifically um, asked or required of enslaved women, uh, we know that Sally Hemings was a seamstress. Uh, we know Priscilla Hemings was, uh, as we said earlier, a nursemaid working in the house, taking care of the children. We know of several women, including Ursula Granger, who were cooks here. Uh, and I would venture to call them chefs. They're all highly trained for years at a time to do the work that they do here. Um, we know of enslaved women who worked uh, as, um, they worked in the textile factories here at Monticello and were responsible for carding wool and turning other raw materials into clothing for the enslaved community. Uh, and we know that even in their personal time, they're still working, that um, once they go home at the end of the day, they're taking care of their families, uh, they're responsible for growing gardens to supplement the diet that they're provided as part of the rations given to enslaved people. Uh, so enslaved women really do it all uh, and they're doing everything here. Um, but it's important to talk about these women outside of what is required of them as well. So Crystal mentioned a bit about uh, this independent economy within the enslaved community. And we know through Martha Jefferson's records that uh, they're buying things from the enslaved community here. Uh, they're buying poultry, they're buying eggs, and in some cases they're buying vegetables that are out of season that enslaved people have stowed away uh, in storage spaces under their uh, cabins. Uh, and we know that this economy is a great source of pride for, for the enslaved community, that they're able to um, 
in some cases, uh, make a little bit of income that is um, outside of their normal work. And we know that this income comes into play. Uh, we see lots of examples with enslaved men in particular uh, who use the wages that they have in order to uh, run away or provide for themselves or provide for the freedom of their families. And so uh, this independent economy is really critical to life here at Monticello for the enslaved community, especially enslaved women. And we've talked a little bit about this uh, throughout our, our time together, but could you talk a little bit more about the Getting Word Project, what that is and why it's so important? Thanks for that question. Uh, the Getting Word Project is, as I mentioned earlier, an oral history project that we have here at Monticello. Uh, we've been doing Getting Word since 1993, uh, and it was our effort to get to understand the enslaved community on their own terms, uh, to look for their lives and their stories outside of Jefferson's records. So the goal with our oral history project is to record oral histories with uh, descendants of the people who lived and worked here at Monticello. And we've, over the years, been able to interview over 225 descendants of people who were enslaved here. And of course, that's just a drop in the bucket. There are probably tens of thousands of descendants out there. Um, but the stories that we have collected show us the breadth of the African-American experience, that we're able to track these families from slavery here at Monticello uh, through emancipation, through uh, fighting for civil rights as part of um, the civil rights movement. Um, we've got descendants who were activists and very prominent in a lot of ways in history. So. Uh, the Getting Word Project really opens up all the opportunities that we have to talk about this enslaved community in more complete ways and through the eyes of their own families and their own descendants. Absolutely. I know as a, a guide here at Monticello, learning um, the stories of enslaved people through the Getting Word Project really helps us to formulate their stories as people, as you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're seeing in some of the, the comments, people are curious about the relationship between Sally Hemings and Jefferson's wife, Martha Jefferson. We're wondering, Naya, if you could speak a little bit more to that. Absolutely. That's such a complicated story because it's so surprising to learn that Sally Hemings and Martha Jefferson are half sisters. Uh, but they share a father, John Wales. And Elizabeth Hemings, who's Sally Hemings' mother, had six children by John Wales. And so many of the people, uh, enslaved people who were living and working closest to the Jefferson family, uh, were in fact related to Martha Jefferson um, as her half sisters and brothers. And so uh, it gets very complicated when we also think about the nature of Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings um, and knowing that there is a power dynamic um, between masters and enslaved women uh, that we always have to address if we're talking about uh, the relationship between these two people. And so uh, not only is there this gross power dynamic, but there's also uh, this other aspect of them being related uh, through his wife. Well, so <laughs> we, we've answered so many questions today that were posed in the chat. And um, we wanna thank you all for tuning in to today's live stream. And we hope that you will join us again uh, next week as we continue sharing the stories of women here at Monticello. And again, we are so grateful and thankful for you for tuning in today to learn about Monticello's enslaved women. Thanks for joining. <laughs>